Okay, so we're finally going to start. We went through our design guidelines last time, and now we're finally going to start design. We're going to start with gravity walls. And I'm going to talk about um, two different gravity wall systems today. The first thing we're going to talk about in the first presentation is on cantilevered concrete retaining walls. We're not going to go through the design. Uh, um, we're not gonna, I'm not going to give you design problems on this, and we're not going to go into the complete design of these because they're covered completely in the undergraduate course. But I realize, but I'm going to start this section off uh, with uh, a review of those designs for two reasons. One, because I know some of you hadn't have it. I'm at least going to go through all design processes and procedures so you know what the steps are. And two, all, the beginning of all the gravity wall designs is the same, where we've got to look at overturning and sliding and um, bearing capacity. And so that part's the same for all the walls. So it's a good place to start. So today we're going to start off with cantilevered wall design. Uh, and I, I had pre the the, I now I forgot the name of the paper, the paper about the, the field test on a cantilevered wall that we talked about last time. Um, I'd forgotten that the last time I did this course I covered that paper in this lesson, uh, but we covered it last time. So I'm not going to cover it again, but since I didn't have my stuff together and get this stuff all posted like last Friday, uh, um, I'm, we're probably going to get done early. I know that's going to break your heart. That, you know, you guys come here just to be here till nine o'clock at night, but uh, we're probably going to get done early because I'm not going to recover that that Labaz and it's Labaz and somebody. Um, so uh, we're going to start with cantilevered wall design, and then we're going to then we'll do a second. The second block is going to be looking at the modular wall design. We'll go through all the different kinds there are, but specifically spend time talking about Gabion walls. Okay, so cantilevered wall design. So. Um, the um, beginning of this, we'll be talking about external failure modes. And as I said, these are the same for all the gravity wall systems. So you need to understand all the external failure, mo uh, the failure modes. And the ones that are appropriate for cantilevered walls are going to be the same for all gravity wall systems. Uh, and then you're going to uh, have to assess those, uh, re those external uh, gravity wall systems. Uh, the design requirements. And, and I've given you a, a homework problem, uh, just posted a homework problem on uh, Gabians for you to design. Uh, and then uh, you should be able to do the, the geometric design for any of these wall systems when we're done. And we're going to talk about the approaches for the structural reinforcement design, but we're not going to go through the structural reinforcement design of these. So if you want to do that, you've got to come back and take CE424. Or teach, your, teach it your, to yourself. It's not that hard. All right, well, there's a common set of external failure modes that any of the gravity wall systems can, can undergo. Uh, and the first one is sliding. And this is where the horizontal forces uh, pushing the wall in this direction exceed those that can resist it, which are a passive force here plus a shear force down here. And the wall actually slides sideways. So that's one failure mode that we can have. The second failure mode we can have is overturning where there's a moment imbalance, and there's enough moment imbalance that the wall can actually turn over. Uh, when you see walls leaning, it's sometimes hard to tell exactly what the failure mode is, and, and it's not always overturning. We'll talk about that when we get to the internal failure modes. But that's the second uh, failure mode that we always check. The third is a bearing capacity failure. Well, you're, you're going to have, um, not only are you going to have horizontal loads here, but you're going to have vertical loads. And if you put fill out here, you're going to have a very large vertical load, as we saw from the, from the uh, case history we looked at. And so you've got to check bearing capacity. This is generally a problem when you have weak soils under the wall, but it's, but it's a check that's required. And then uh, you can always have excessive settlement of your wall. So those are the main failure modes that we're going to check. Another one which I want to spend some time talking about, because it's a really, really important one, and we are not covering it in this class. Uh, but it's, it's a very uh, important failure mode and sometimes the one that controls. I think I've mentioned this before already, but that's the global stability. And uh, I use this example where you could design these two walls and you could check all the loads on them and individually they'd be fine. Uh, and I've a they've actually seen failures of this type that I'm about to describe. So everything looks good, right? When the real issue is that you've got a global stability problem and it's really a slope stability problem. Um, so this is approached as a slope stability uh, design. And since it's a slope stability uh, design approach, 
It's not covered here, it's covered in the slope stability class. So I think it's really important that you understand that this failure mode exists, that you got to take care of it, and then you need to check the designs for these. And it's particularly important since we're not going to be covering it. So global stability is a big thing, but not covered by us. All right, well, let's look at the earth pressure diagram that we'll, we'll get for uh, a cantilevered retaining wall. And we presented this briefly before, but we'll go into more detail now. So the free body diagram we use is not the wall itself, but a, a unit of soil around the, the wall and the soil surrounding the wall. In particular, we take this line straight up the back side of the wall, and we're going to assume that all this material in here, the soil over the toe, the soil over the heel, and the wall itself all act as one unit. And then we're going to calculate the earth pressures acting outside this particular free body. So we're going to choose this free body. We do that because we can't really get active and passive earth pressures directly here behind the wall because the heel of the wall is going to interfere with our ability to reach those conditions. So just as a way of analysis, we're just going to step behind it and assume all that, wall, the, all that soil behind it goes, goes along for the ride. So if we do that, um, the free body diagram is going to look something like this. You're going to have the, 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 uh, the weight of the wall material. Now we normally break that down into, um, you normally break that down into a bunch of different, at least four different pieces. You usually break it down into this, the weight of the stem, the weight of the footing, the weight of the soil behind the wall and the weight of the soil in front of the wall. But when you, when you add them all up, you're going to have, you, can, you can present it as a single vector. So just to keep our, our, our diagram uncluttered, I'm just going to show a single reaction there. Then on the back of the wall, um, you're going to have an earth pressure. And you can use Coulomb or you can use Rankin here. It's, it's, um, uh, either, one, either one is used a lot on this one. In fact, Rankin is probably more common for this wall design uh, than, uh, than uh, Coulomb, but as we got through saying in the last lesson, Coulomb will give you a, pretty, a, a, a better estimate of the earth pressures than Rankin will, particularly when, this, when, the, when there's a back slope. Uh, in this case, if you're using Coulomb, your um, um, if you're using Coulomb, your wall friction angle should be, again, about two-thirds of phi prime, as we discussed last time. Now, we discussed this a little uh, last time. We'll get into a little more detail now. Uh, on the passive side, there's a lot of questions about what to do about passive pressures. Um, certainly, if your wall is going to be constructed and you're sure nobody's going to disturb anything in front of your wall, then, you can, then there's no reason not to account for passive pressures. You should be using the log spiral method for cuking, uh, calculating Ka. Uh, you can use um, Rankin if you want a conservative low number for, I'm sorry, Kp, if you want a conservative low number for Kp. But the real question isn't about, about that. The question is, what do we assume the conditions are for the, the passive earth pressures? It's generally not considered a good idea to take the full, the uh, didn't draw that very well, to take the full passive pressure from the ground surface down because in many, many walls, there's a great chance that somebody's going to go in front of your wall and dig something out. Uh, somebody's going to come together, there's going to be some construction, and if you're depending on that passive pressure in your design of your wall, and somebody comes along, my favorite example, somebody comes in to put in a utility, and they're going to dig a nice big long trench the whole length of your wall to put in this utility line, there's going to be no passive pressure there. So that's a real issue on the passive side. Um, and we'll spend some more time talking about that. And then on the base, we have um, some shear resisting force. Uh, and if we, uh, and we, we can sum forces in the x direction uh, equal to zero, and we, we can calculate what this, this required shear is on, on the base. And then we have a, a normal reaction on the base, and we can get the normal reaction by summing forces in the vertical direction. So normally we compute, we, we know the weight, that's simple, we compute the passive, uh, the active earth pressure, 
Uh, we'll talk in a minute about what parameters we choose to use for passive design. And then we can uh, calculate the required shear on the base and, and, the, and the reaction for normal force on the base. Uh, that that uh, uh, vertical reaction will always have some eccentricity. It's not going to be in the middle of the uh, footing. So we need to calculate its location. That's going to be important to us. And to do that, we usually sum moments about the toe of the wall. So we use um, all three of these equilibrium equations, and we can compute um, not only the, uh, the forces, but we can also compute the distribution of stress on the base under the assumption that it's a linear uh, stress distribution, not constant, but linear, which it isn't going to be, but we can make that assumption. Am I on the next slider? Okay. I'm trying to remember why I did that. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is check sliding. I put our, our little free body diagram off to the right. So um, we'll have both friction and cohesion along the base, depending on what the soil uh, type of material is underneath the, the uh, soil. Uh, we'll usually compute a factor of safety. Uh, so the factor of the safety will be the resisting forces over the driving forces. Um, so the, the, vertical, um, the vertical reaction on the base times the tangent of whatever our interface friction angle is between the base material and the, and the concrete, uh, it will be our frictional component. And then whatever um, cohesion, effective cohesion, if there is any, uh, on the base uh, times the, the length of the base will be the cohesive force. And then the driving force on the bottom is RS, that sum of re mobilized forces that we need to, to counteract the, um, the other horizontal forces in the problem. Normally, uh, for uh, allowable stress design, if we have a factor of safety of 1.5, we this is satisfactory. If it's not, there are a bunch of ways to increase the the sliding resistance. The first and usually the most effective way to increase the sliding resistance is to increase the width of the footing and in particular increase the the heel. And I'll give you a second here to think about why would so we we can you know, we say we increase B. We can either increase it in the heel or we increase, increase it in the toe. But increasing the heel is going to dramatically improve our sliding resistance. And I'll give you a second to think about that. You can tell me why would we want to increase it on the heel rather than the toe. When we increase it on the heel, what's going to happen? Yeah, we're, we're going to move our free body diagram out here. And we're going to get a whole lot more soil, which is going to, so W is going to go up, so our reaction is going to go up, and we're going to get a lot more resistance. So that's by far the most effective way. The, the, when you run into trouble on that is when you've got some right-of-way limit back here. You know, if you have this thing right, if this, if this is your right-of-way, and you've got the thing right up against the right-of-way, and you can't move back, then you've got to think about some of the alternatives. So, so the alternatives you can do is you can increase the depth of the footing, and that's going to do what for us? What's increasing the depth going to do for us? Increasing the depth is going to increase the active earth pressure. So why, why would that help? Passive. Well, it's going to increase the passive, too, and the passive is going to increase much faster than the active. So assuming you can, assuming you can depend on the passive, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, increasing the depth will help, assuming that, that uh, we've got a caveat from that we'll talk about in a minute. And then the last thing you can do is put in tie downs, which is a really expensive solution. Uh, it's done, uh, but boy, it's got to be, that's got to be kind of like a last resort. Um, and alternatively, this is done to, to put deep foundations in, but generally speaking, we're going to put deep foundations in when we have not so much to resist um, um, sliding, but when we have, found, when we have uh, bearing capacity problems. But it's certainly a way that's going to solve your sliding problems, too. And finally, the one that's, that's, that's also very common uh, is to add a shear key. And we'll spend a minute talking about that in the, in the again. This is, this is essentially, the shear key is essentially 
a cheaper way to get additional passive resistance than increasing the entire footing width, and it doesn't it does not increase your active pressures. But there's some significant issues with that. So let's talk about keys. So generally speaking, when we put keys in, they enter, generally end up right under the stem. And that's for a structural design reason, because this key is going to require, you're going to require some um, um, reinforcement in this key, because otherwise you have a shear failure of the key. So it's pretty, it's really common to put them right over the stem, because your stem reinforcement is going to come right down there, and then you can, you can hook your stem reinforcement right in there, and, and it's really easy to put the key in. So they're often under the stem, but it's not clear that's the most effective place for them. Um, some people will contend the best place for them is at the back, and we'll discuss that in a minute. It actually might be not at all a bad design to put them on the front. We'll talk about why in just a second here. Well, the assumed uh, sliding surface for a key, when, when most people do the design, this is the assumed sliding surface that they take. Um, and the assumption is that you can get passive resistance fully along this height. And maybe, depending on what your design is, you might even be able to um, gather the passive resistance in, in front of the toe. So this is a real common design where people say, look, I can't, I can't really depend on what's going on up here. There might be some disturbance to the soil. So I'm going to ignore all this soil up here. But I'm going to assume that I can generate passive resistance on the face of my footing and down through the key. But that assumes that, for some, that somehow this wall is going to decide to slide on that surface. Um, well, um, the real question is, which passive wedge do we use? Do we use this one? Do we assume that we have the full, the full passive resistance up to the ground surface, um, but we ignore the surface part of it? Um, or do we do as I showed here? Or do we assume that we're just going to use uh, we're just going to ignore the surface. And I think people have done all these kinds of things. Um, the second set of assumptions is about what the actual failure surface is. It's pretty clear from some evidence. I mean, why would the soil decide to slide across horizontally when it could just fail right across here in sort of a typical slope stability or bearing capacity failure? So it's really not clear at all that, that this passive wedge would ever form. Uh, it is clear that putting a key down in here is going to force a failure through the soil instead of being along the surface. Uh, and it's definitely going it's, it's, I mean, to have more capacity there than if you, than if you didn't have, a, if you didn't have a, a key. But it's not at all clear that you're going to get that full passive resistance. And the other issue that's a big uh, concern uh, is the movements that are required to mobilize the, the passive resistance compared to the active resistance. And we looked at that. Uh, I mean, you remember from uh, one of the um, laboratory tests, you know, they reached 20% displacement of the wall height, and they still hadn't in, in, in the uh, in the loose sand, and they still hadn't maxed out the passive resistance. So that's a big issue too. So all of which is to say is you should be very conservative about how you deal with passive resistance on the on the front side of the wall. I think it's fairly as long as you're confident nobody's going to come in here and, and, and uh, dig a trench in front of your wall, I think it's fairly reasonable to use this passive wedge. Uh, you assume that the surface is gone and that you, you're going to use this passive wedge from the base of the, or from the top of the, the uh, footing to the, down to the key. Um, so, so one of the one of the arguments for moving the wedge, moving the the key up to the front, is that if you move it up to the front, you're definitely going to generate some kind of passive resistance all along here. Uh, if you have it all the way at the back, you know you're just going to get a nice gradual surface coming up there, and um, there's not it's not clear at all that you're going to form that passive wedge. So I think that putting the key close to, uh, this is kind of anti-intuitive for people, but putting the key closer to the front should make it more effective. 
By the way, I haven't seen any really good data. And uh, I'm going to have you write, uh, do the summary of um, Labuse and I can't think of the name of the, the second author now, that, that retaining wall field history. And they have some, they have some earth pressure measurements in that. Uh, they have earth pressure measurements. Um, they have load cells, earth pressure cells there, there, and they have several along the base. And, and these ones in particular on the faces of these are quite, the data from them is quite interesting. So when you, when you look at that paper, take a good look at the data from the load cells uh, in front of the key and in front of the face of the pudding for passive pressure. It's pretty interesting data. All right, so that's sliding. Um, overturning. So here's our free body diagram. Um, we want to, the first part of overturning, it's not really an overturning issue, it's, it's sort of an efficiency of our base issue. We really want to ensure that the vertical reaction, the normal reaction force of the base acts within the middle third of the footing. If it acts right at the edge of the footing, then we know that our theoretical linear uh, distribution of stresses on the bottom is triangular. If it, starts to, if it starts to move outside of there, then what we have is, I mean, theoretically, we'd have a distribution of stresses that look like that, but we can't get it. So there's, we're going to get a, we're going to get instead a distribution of stresses that looks um, something like this. It's actually going to be higher at the toe than you would predict from your, and there's going to be zero back there. Uh, so that's just a really inefficient design because you basically got a bunch of the footing you're putting back there that's not helping you with overturning. So we try and make, we try and get a design where the reaction force acts in the middle third of the footing. Uh, and then we're going to compute um, this factor of safety against overturning. And we do this in, in terms of moments, not in terms of forces. And we're going to, uh, the, the factor of safety against overturning is going to be that, those moments that are resisting overturning over those moments that are driving overturning. And we do a little interesting analysis here, which is um, rather arbitrary. Um, um, but we well, it doesn't matter where we it doesn't matter where we sum the, the moments about. But it's gen we generally do it about the toe, and there's a reason for doing that. So we just sum moments about the toe, um, and obviously the resisting moments are, you know, you know what's going to be resisting overturning is going to be your weight. It's going to be your passive resistance. Um, it's going to be the vertical part of your active earth pressure, like right, the vertical component of it. Um, and then the driving forces are going to be uh, PA and RN. And the shear is not going to provide any moment about that point. And we generally, fi uh, 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 generally find that a factor safety of two or, or greater is, is an, an, an acceptable design for a, uh, allowable stress type design. Um, if we don't, um, um, we don't have an acceptable design. Uh, we have, the, we have uh, uh, some of the same remedies we had before. Now, in this case, when we're talking about increasing the footing width, uh, it's still more effective to increase the footing width on the back than the front because we have the same issue. We're going to pick up weight back here. But increasing on the front is still pretty effective. Uh, and increasing on the front is effective because what are we doing by increasing the, uh, the footing width on the front? The best way to think about it is just think about some moments about the toe. If I move my if I move my point out to here, how does that affect the uh, driving? The biggest driving moment is going to come from your earth resistance. How does that affect the driving moment from the earth resistance? Yeah, for a moment. Does it? How does that affect that? Well, nothing happens for for your earth pressure because it's the moment arm is not going to change. But what happens for your resisting forces, for W, this vertical part, and for W in particular, what happens to the moment arm when you move it up front? It increases quickly, right? So if you have a problem with, so if, you, if you've got a right-of-way problem, so if you're back here and you've got a right-of-way problem again, uh, and you're OK with sliding, but you've got a moment problem, then you can increase the toe, the toe width. But still, in general, it's, it's, it's more effective for almost everything to increase the heel rather than the toe.
the downside of that is unless if it's a if it if it's a cut if it's a cut wall system and you're doing a temporary excavation, the more you increase the heel, the more you got to excavate behind it. So that's always a, a the downside of it. But but increasing the toe is effective. You can put and you can put tie downs in, or again you can use a deep foundation. All right, bearing capacity. Um, this is one that is probably the one that's done incorrectly the most often. Um, the, and the best way to think about this is this, let's not even think about this as a wall. Just think about the base as a footing. The total reaction on the, on the footing is going to be eccentric and at, at an angle. We're not going to have a vertical, we're not going to have a vertical load of, it's always going to be an angle and it's always going to be eccentric. So we need a bearing capacity uh, method that can account for those. Uh, and, and they exist, and people seldom use them. Um, didn't go through my force. So, so uh, th these, here's, here's your forces acting on the wall. Uh, you've got a net, you got a net uh, driving force. You've got your reaction here, both, both the, the shear and the normal reaction. There's going to be some ex eccentricity. Now. Uh, and we're going and we're going to end up again with as long as we keep this reaction in the middle third, we're going to end up with this triangular distribution, and we're going to end up with a Q max and a Q min, and there are, everybody's all excited about computing uh, about computing Q max, and this is a really really common incorrect approach to do. There's there's several incorrect approaches. One um, is to compute the allowable um, the 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 allowable bearing stress considering just the vertical forces. This is very commonly done. You, they, t they, just, they take all the vertical forces. Hey, it's a footing. I got vertical forces. Take the vertical forces. I'm gonna, you just do your standard bearing capacity calculation. Calculate a bear, uh, allowable, bearing, uh, allowable bearing capacity. That's not all the loads acting on the footing. That's not all the loads that can generate a bearing capacity failure. Um, and then it's really common to say, all right, well, I, the maximum um, the maximum, I calculate the maximum toe pressure based on the eccentricity, and I just want that less, to be less than the allowable. Um, and, and that's not an appropriate approach. For one thing, you could probably let the, uh, depending on how you calculated the allowable bearing stress, you could probably let Q max exceed it a little bit, and it's not going to hurt you any. Um, so it's critical that we consider, consider both the eccentricity and the inclined load. We consider the eccentricity by use, using our equivalent footing width, um, this comes from Meyerhoff, uh, where we, we, we reduce the footing width by a factor of twice the eccentricity. So we essentially take our, we, we're going to shrink our footing down. And then we're going to compute a, an equivalent, we're going to, we'll compute an equivalent, uh, so this will be B prime. Uh, an equivalent vertical uh, stress that's applied on that smaller footing, and we just basically do our whole bearing capacity calculation based on this equivalent footing. And it will be a footing that has no eccentricity. That's, that's why you do this exercise. I guess I drew it on the wrong side. It would be on the other side. Let me redo that. Your equivalent footing would be over here so that your reaction is in the center of it. And you're going to get a different, you're going to get an equivalent bearing stress. Your, your equivalent bearing stress is going to be greater than Q min and less than Q max. It'll be, and it'll, it'll actually be greater than Q average. But it'll be less than Q max. That's the whole point. You don't need to design for the worst case at the, at the end. You need to design for the equivalent uh, bearing stress on the re the, the uh, equivalent footing width, which the footing, that footing width that gives you no, uh, non-eccentric load. And this is a standard uh, design method that you can find in any foundations book. If you want some suggestions, there's this hot new one out that I can tell you all about. Um, and then the other thing we need to do is we need to use a bearing capacity formula that accounts for the inclined load. This is, this is a thing that I think is seldom done. It's almost never done, I think. Um, and because this inclined load is going to reduce your bearing capacity. So there's, um, 
two methods published out there that do that. Uh, the Meyerhoff and Hansen, and check the dates out of these. This is not like it's new stuff. And then Vesich. Uh, Vesich is a method that's included in um, uh, Professor Kudos and now Professor Kudos mine and uh, Dr. Young's uh, foundation's text. So this is simple stuff that's out there. Um, but the most common method is they just compute an allowable bearing stress based only on this vertical reaction and then say, well, I want to make sure my peak load is less than that. And it's, it's not an appropriate uh, uh, approach. It's kind of conservative in terms of the eccentricity, but it's non-conservative in terms of the um, inclined load. And there's good solutions out there for what you want to do already, and they're not that complicated, particularly with a spreadsheet. They're really simple. So you should be using one of those methods to compute the bearing capacity. Um, settlement. Um, we're just going to use a traditional method for settlement analysis. If it's a, if you have a, a cohesionless material, you can use uh, either uh, Schmertman's method or uh, probably a better method, I think, is to use um, um, the dilatometer data and use Marchetti's method or any method where you can get the modulus. Um, so the, uh, so, um, so the, the elastic approach would be for mostly for cohesionless. So this would be um, Marchetti or um, Schmertman. By the way, Schmertman now thinks that Marchetti's method is better than his, so um, I, I think people don't like Marchetti's method because the, the, the dilatometer, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to get data from a CPT, it's cheaper to get CPT data than it is to get dilatometer data. I think that's the main reason. Uh, if, you got a, if you have clay soils behind there, uh, then you can do a traditional consolidation analysis. That's fine. Um, but don't forget... Um, that your loaded area is finite and you're not going to get uniform settlements. This was, uh, this was some more data that was clear from La, La Boos and I should look that, that paper up so I can quit saying I don't know the name of it. Um, but you're, uh, particularly if it's, a, if it's a built wall, you're going to definitely get um, um, a lot more load behind the wall in the front and you're going to get this kind of behavior particularly if you're on a clay foundation, which is exactly what we saw in the data from that field test, right? So don't forget to do your settlement analysis. It's pretty straightforward. And don't forget to include the, uh, the fill conditions. I, this, you're going to get a very, you, you should be doing a very different analysis if this was actually a, uh, a uh, cut slope and you just cut back tempor temporarily and fill up. Like if, if this was slope originally looked like this, and then you get a temporary cut back to here and then fill it up, then you're going to get a very different analysis than if the condition was that um, this was the original slope and this is all fill back here. So make sure you think about, because in one case you're unloading and then reloading and you're going to be on a different uh, stress strain curve in the other case than you are in the other case. So you need to think a lot about the construction sequence and what's really going on. If it's this case in blue, you're probably not going to get this tilt like I showed. But if it's the case in red, you're definitely going to get that backwards tilt. So it's really important that you think about the loading paths that the, that the soils undergo and how you're doing the construction. All right, so the, the wall design process. So um, the first, the, the, the process starts by somebody telling you that they need some clear space. So normally, you've, I mean, the situation is either you've got something like this and somebody says, hey, I need to have this space open. Or you've got something like this and they say, hey, I need to have this space filled. They're, gonna give you the, they're not going to give you the dimensions of the wall. They're going to give you the geometry that they're required to have free to do whatever they're going to put in that spot. So that's usually how the, the process starts. Um, and then you need to figure out what the soil conditions are Realize when you're trying to figure out what the soil conditions, there's two different soils. This happens in almost all walls, but, but there's, I mean, there could be lots of different kinds of soils. But you've got to make sure you understand the difference between foundation soils and backfill soils as a minimum. Because the foundation soils, you have less control over unless you're going to over-excavate and recompact them all. But the backfill soils, you've got a lot of choice about. 
So realize that there's a difference between foundation soils and backfill soils. And by foundation soils, I mean that's this stuff down here, and the backfill soil is what goes directly behind your wall. So these are, ah, I hate it when that happens. These are the backfill soils, and then the red ones are the foundation soils. Um, usually, you, this is an iterative process, so you start out by guessing the dimensions of the wall, and there's some good guidelines for you. There's this figure. Uh, there's a figure in uh, Kuduta Young and Kitch, you can use, uh, Kuduta Kitch and Young, if you want to use that. And there's, and, and in fact, uh, the FHA W1 came from, maybe even came from the NAFIC. I'm not sure. Uh, I think we've got a picture of that coming up, I do believe. Yeah, it's coming up next time. Um, so you start off with some, some, you know, rules of thumb about what the sizes are. Ah. I hate it when I do that. Generally, the first thing you're going to do is check sliding because that's often the external mode that controls and, it, and, and what, it, what it really controls is it's going to control your footing width and particularly the length of your heel. So that's generally the first check. Don't check the other ones first because if you check everything else first and mess around with your design, you're going to come back to sliding and then find out you have to, you have to solve the problem for sliding. So that's usually the, the first check to do. Then overturning after that, overturning is usually not a problem. Um, and then finally check bearing capacity. And if you've got a cohesive, if you've got a cohesionless soil or in a well-drained soil, you're probably not going to have a bearing capacity problem. It's almost impossible to. Uh, but if you have um, clay soils and you have uh, cohesive soils, you're possibly going to have a bearing capacity problem, and you definitely need to check the drained and the undrained conditions to understand which one's going to be most important to you. You know, lots of times when we talk about foundation design, we say, well, I just do a fee equals zero analysis and don't worry about the drain conditions it's, for the clays because it's always going to control. Well, that's because in foundations, we're always increasing the load. We increase the load so the soil is going to consolidate afterwards and it's going to have a higher shear strength in the long term than it is in the short term. So uh, fee equals zero short term analysis is going to control. Be careful in walls because that's not always true. In some walls, we're unloading. If we're doing this wall, we're unloading the soil. We're going to take a bunch of soil out, right? When we take that soil out, what's going to happen to the foundation soils underneath it? Well, they're going to be unloaded. So they're going to swell. And when they swell, they're going to dilate and they're going to lose strength. So in walls, don't, don't get tricked into this, this thought that we have other places where, oh, just do a fee equals zero analysis. That's, you know, for the short term, that controls. It may not control for walls. Any case where you're unloading, you need to be really careful to check the long-term uh, shear strength and make sure you have the right shear strength parameters, particularly if you have uh, over-consolidated clays, if you have stiff over-consolidated clays. Um, all right. If, uh, if settlement's going to be an issue, then make sure you do your settlement analysis. And then, and then once you've got the, the geometry of the wall figured out from a geotechnical standpoint, then we normally do the structural design. It's important when you start with these um, estimated dimensions, these, these tools for essay, estimating dimensions have a little bit of structural design requirements built into them because you, what you don't want to do is get a wall that's so skinny and hey, it works great, but it's all skinny and everything that you can't do the structural design. And now when you do the structural design, the dimensions are so much different than what you started with, you got to go back and redo the geotechnical design. And this becomes less and less of an issue uh, with um, the software that's available now to do this stuff. Um, so this is your typical um, design guidelines you start with. This is the one out of your current FHWA manual I gave you. It's exactly the same as the one that was in the 1995 version or 99 version, except that, that they went from SI units back to English units. Um, and you can find these in a lot of places. But this is pretty typical. By the way, we, we always do put a batter on the front of the wall. Um, even if it, 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 there's two reasons for doing a batter. There's one is that the, there's a good reason for the wall, to, the stem, to get thinner from the bottom to the top because the stem design is going to be driven by moment capacity. And you're going to have a huge, you remember you got your active earth pressure here. You got a huge moment there and very little moment at the top, so you don't need as much concrete. So it's nice to taper it off because it, it saves material. But the other reason is if you've if you have ever uh, you know, um, 
if you ever stood in front of something that's perfectly vertical and you stand in front of it, it looks like it's leaning over on you. In fact, that's the way that the Greek, if you, go to, if you go to Greece and you look at the ancient Roman and Greek columns, you know, they, get, they actually get narrower as you go up. Because, and they look perfectly vertical, but they actually get smaller in diameter as you go up. So we always batter it because it uh, makes people feel better when they stand under the wall. It doesn't look like it's falling over on them. Um, so that, that may be, seem like a trivial issue, but it turns out to be kind of important. So let's talk, I'm not, as I say, I'm not going to go through the structural design, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to go through the, uh, the uh, overview of the structural design procedures. So um, we generally start with the stem design for the wall. And we design that we, we, do, uh, we do design this, the stem and the footing separately. So uh, the stem, um, we're going to put on, uh, we, we, have to, we have to use uh, an LRFD des design for this. Uh, you can do an LRFD design for the geotechnical part of the design. Now, in the geotechnical part of the design I presented so far, I was just talking about um, um, factors of safety and just ASD design. But the, the, the LRFD design guidelines are in the FHWA manual. And if, if I find time in the quarter somewhere, I haven't done, a, I haven't done a, a, a module on LRFD design for walls, but if I find time sometime in the quarter to put one together, I'll sneak it in someplace. But for right now, I'll just tell you that it's there. But for the structural design, we have to do that because those designs are all based on load and, load and resistance factor design. So remember that if you're doing ASD design for your geotechnical design and just using factors of safety, that's fine. But when you do the structural design, you've got to put in factor loads. So you're going to put in your factored earth pressure. Uh, that's going to be a linear function. And uh, this, is, this is interesting. You know, when we were doing the geotechnical design, we said, well, you know, this earth pressure can't really happen back there, so we're going to take this free body diagram and we're going to do our external design on that. But when we do our structural design, we're going to we're going to assume what we just said couldn't happen exactly that there is an earth, that you do get the full active earth pressure under. That's conservative because you're probably not going to get the full active earth pressure under because you're going to have all kinds of stuff down here that prevents you from getting the full active earth pressure. So it's, it's, it's an appropriate way to approach the structural design. But notice that it's, it's you know, we're, we're just doing what we said we couldn't do in the geotechnical design. That's typical for structural engineers. They do all kinds of things geotechs would never do. I'm trying to goad you guys, but it doesn't seem to be working. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna have a linear function for the forces, uh, and then uh, for the I'm sure for the for the applied stress. So obviously we're gonna get a second order function for for shear, and then a moment will be a third order order function, right? So this is the shear is gonna be to to uh, z2, and uh, and the moment's gonna be to z3, because this one's gonna be to z1, z z to the one. So we have a really big shear load that generates very quickly at the, at the stem. So that's going to control our design for um, the structural design of the stem. Uh, we generally don't use any kind of shear reinforcement. I'd say generally, uh, if you get to really, really, really big um, retaining structure, structures, sometimes people start putting shear reinforcement in them. I have seen it. But typically for uh, the, the, the walls up to, say, you know, 15, 18 feet, uh, most people don't put shear reinforcement in them. Um, so the, the, the bending moments in the, uh, um, so uh, let me step back. So that means, since we're not putting shear reinforcement, which means all the shear has got to be buried by the concrete, so the thickness of the stem is going to be controlled by the shear design. And this is going to be true for the footing, too. So generally, you know, when we design most, when we design reinforced beams, usually the first thing we do is we de we design them for bending, and then we add shear reinforcement to make sure they carry they can handle the shear capacity. When it comes to retaining wall design, we do it the other way around. We first design for shear because we're not going to put shear reinforcement in, and we got to make sure we have enough concrete to resist the shear, and then we figure out how much steel we need for bending. So the design process is kind of opposite the process that you would do for for most structural beams. And that's essentially we're designing a beam here. Um, so we, we, we do shear first. Uh, then we're going to check moments and figure out how much steel we need. Um, and because this moment diagram tails off as, a, as a cubic, the cube of z, really quickly this moment drops down. 
And so lots of times we're going to go in and, and the, the, the number of bars that you need at the base to carry this moment is way more than you're going to need up here. So you'll see that the bars are cut off. If you go look at a retaining wall that's, being, that, that's got the steel up and they haven't cast it, you'll see that there's every other or sometimes two out of every three bars will be cut off uh, because you don't need all that steel capacity when you get to the top because your moment's way, way down because it increases by the cube. So that's, that's a, an important, um, in fact, I would say any wall taller than 10 feet, you probably should be, you probably can save money by cutting off part of your reinforcement. And I'm not going to teach you how to do that. Um, next we do the footing design. Often uh, we'll take the, uh, the, the flexural steel for the um, um, stem and just turn it right in uh, to, we can turn it uh, two ways. We can turn it that way or we can turn it this way. But in the stem, this, the, the, the form shape of our footing is going to look like this. So in this one, we're going to have the smiley faced uh, beam and it's going to want reinforcement on the bottom. In this case, we've got the frowny beam and it's going to want reinforcement at the top. So it's not usually, if, so if we bring our, our um, steel down from the stem and turn it back, uh, it doesn't do us any good and we can't bring it down and turn it right into here because then we're not going to have enough development length for that steel that goes up the wall. So generally it comes down and goes up to the front because it does something for you there. That's if you, have a, if you have a toe. It's possible to design a wall without a toe. Um, so uh, the loads on there are the footing dead loads. We have the soil weight behind uh, and above the heel. That's one of our other loads. And then we have the footing bearing pressure. So th this is the, the, the free body diagram. Um, we have, I just got through discussing this. We've got to make sure that, the, the, that we, have enough length, we have enough thickness in here to de properly develop the steel that's going to be going up the stem. Sometimes that controls the thickness of the footing. Not always, but sometimes that controls the thickness of the footing. Um, and if, assuming that, that um, that's not controlling the thickness of the footing, then we, again, we will, we're, we're not going to put any uh, shear reinforcement in the footing. So the, the shear requirements for the footing will generate, um, will determine the um, required thickness. Um, we're going to design the toe steel. I'm getting too much on my figure here. Let me get rid of some of this. The steel for the toe will design based on our footing pressure. In other words, we're going to draw, this will be our, uh, this, this really isn't the critical section, but we usually take it as a critical section because it's conservative. We're going to look at the net force on the uh, footing and calculate the shear requirement and design for that. Um, and we usually ignore the weight of the soil. In fact, sometimes we even ignore the weight of the footing because it's going to be so much less than, uh, than the applied loads. For the um, flexural design for the heel, we do an interesting uh, design approach. What we do for the heel is, is we assume that the wall, that because of the horizontal uh, earth pressure, the wall is actually rotated just slightly, and the whole heel is lifted up off the ground. So the free body diagram for designing the heel is just that you have all the weight of the soil plus the dead load of the footing acting behind the wall, and you're going to calculate the, she the, the shear requirement from there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a situation that probably doesn't exist, um, but, it's, but it's definitely conservative. So that's the design approach for designing the heel. It, so we use different free body diagrams for the toe than the heel. And by the way, the toe never controls the thickness of the footing because you're always going to have much higher shear forces in the heel, except in the case where you have a wall that doesn't have a heel. Um, and it's possible to design those two, but that's pretty they're pretty unusual. Um, let's see, what did I, oh, I didn't talk, did I talk about? Oh, so you do, uh, we use, I didn't say this, but we're going we're gonna to do, um, we're going to check shear, where is it? Uh, that's going to control the thickness of the footing. And then we got a flex, we just a, just a regular beam flexor design. And we normally, even though the shear critical section and the moment critical section uh, aren't the same, we usually just take them at the, at the face of the stem on both sides. It's conservative for the shear, and it's that, it, that's the correct critical um, 
that's a correct critical, critical section for moment, but for shear, it's, it's actually, the, the critical section for shear actually should be a little farther out here. But we you generally take them right at the face because it's conservative and it doesn't matter and it doesn't drive the design normally. So that's usually what we do. Um, another really important um, failure mode we've got to check is sliding friction on the stem. We want to make sure that the stem doesn't fail by sliding this way across the base. So the base, the, the force on the, the base would be moving this way and the stem would be moving that way. Uh, and we we just again, we're not going to put shear reinforcement. We have we have this steel running through the stem, right? We got this steel that runs from the from the the footing right through the stem. And you might think, oh, we're going to depend on the shear resistance of that steel. There's a bunch of steel in there. We actually ignore all the steel, the shear resistance of all the steel. Uh, the design method, um, the design method is to um, realize that. The maximum force you can have in your steel is the area of the steel times the yield strength of the steel, right? That's the maximum tensile force you can have in your steel. So we're going to assume then that the maximum, we, so, so that's a tensile force there, so there must be a compressive force here that's equal to the same amount, right? If the, if the back, you're right, your, your wall's leaning forward, the back's in tension, the front's in compression. And so we're going to assume that that maximum force uh, can generate a resistance that's equal to the area of the steel times the yield times whatever the interface friction angle is. So it's a little confusing when we do this design because the area of the steel and the yield strength of the steel is in the design, but we're not depending on the shear resistance of the steel to prevent sliding. We're just using that to calculate the, 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 the normal force at the front of the wall to, to resist frictional sliding. Yeah. Ex exactly. So we're saying, let me, let me, I, so I thought I'd said that, obviously hadn't, at least hadn't said it well. So if the steel's at yield, we all understand this, right? That's the maximum force we can get out of that, right? Well then, uh, the, and, you know, and we're getting this tensile force because there's a big bending moment that's turning this thing this way. Well, that means at the front, you know, to match that moment, you know, we've got a compressive force in the concrete. And you got the same one down here. And if you got, if you got the area of steel times Fy here, then this is also As times Fy here from summation of vertical forces equal to zero. And then what we're depending on is this force times mu to provide us the, sh the sliding resistance. So it's a little strange. And, 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 we, and we're not, the, that steel there will, you know, we're, we're not accounting for the fact that the steel also, now this steel, you know, it's not a finite thing. There's also some, some steel shear resistance there, right? right? There's, some, there's some capacity for that steel to resist shear. We're ignoring that completely. So that's the design approach. Um, and the details of this, Picking mu is important. There's a, there's a, the, the, what you select for mu is going to depend on um, how you treat the concrete. They're either smooth or brushed, and, and most people take the most conservative approach. We also almost always have a shear key in here, um, and we don't account for that. Uh, in fact, the shear key, I've, I've talked to people that build these things. They said, well, if we never account for it, why do we go to the trouble to do it? And, they, and people that, the builders actually say it actually helps them in construction to form the key. It gives them a good place to put form work and all that kinds of stuff. So it's actually easier in the construction uh, side of the thing to put the key there because it, pro it provides a good alignment point for the, for the stem and makes sure it's all lined up. So the key is actually a good thing in construction. Uh, the designers like it because it's got to increase the sliding friction, but we ignore it completely in the design process. We assume it's not there. By the way, when you go to form this key, um, I mean, you usually form the key by putting a piece of wood in here in your form work so when you cast your concrete around it, you can pull the piece of wood out. It's really important that you taper the size of the piece of wood. Don't take a uh, two by four and put it in like this, nice and square, uh, and then cast your concrete on it because you're never going to get it out. You're going to have some guy down there with a jackhammer trying to jack out the wood. Uh, so make sure there's a really nice taper on that or you're not going to get that piece of wood out of there. Um, okay, so I think. <clears throat> 
So that's the that's the structure. Any questions about the structural design approach? I realize it was pretty quick. Um, there are lots of good books on this. There's a really good uh, section on this in to, to our own horn, the uh, third edition of the Professor Kudoro's Foundations text just came out that I co-authored with uh, him and uh, Dr. Young, and it hot off the presses, and it's got a really good section on the structural design for cantilevered walls. Um, so let's talk a little bit about counterfort walls. Uh, I'm just going to, again, talk about the design approach. We're not going to talk, we're not going to do the structural design. The geotechnical design is the same as, far, when we do the geotechnical design, the counterforts don't mean anything to us. They're just more mass behind the wall. We don't care. But for the structural design, obviously we're going to design this wall differently than we did the cantilevered. So um, if, I, uh, if I look at this as an elevation from the back, I don't know why I put that there. Maybe it'll become apparent to me in a minute. Um, oh, I'm, oh, I know what. I'm looking down on the wall. That's, I'm just trying to show you that I'm looking down in this direction. Here's my eye. I'm looking down. So these are my counterforts. Uh, here's, this, is the, this is the front of the wall here. So this is the heel back here. And you've got these counterforts in between. And these guys are going to be in tension now, realize. So the, the uh, a design approach is to treat this as a T-beam that has a variable depth. So if we look at one section of this, oh, and, and then the pan, so we, we're going to take, we just designed this as a T-beam, but the depth of the T-beam changes as we come up. So if, if, I, if I was going to look at this A, A prime, realize what I've got is my, my counterfort's going to look like this, right? And, um, and then I've got my face on the T-beam right there, so that's my compressive piece. And then I've got my earth pressure acting behind that. Right, so I've got my earth pressure acting on that. And so it's just a T-beam design, and, a, and, a, and you've just got to check it several places to make sure the capacity of the T-beam is adequate throughout. Because your, your main reinforcement is going to go uh, on this back stem like this. And then I think it gets developed down in here, but I'm not sure. I don't know those kind of details. So you design it just like you do a T-beam for you structural guys. Uh, and then the panels, uh, usually we design just as a, a two-way slab that's fixed on three sides and free on one side. So you design it just like, uh, just like you would a, a two-way uh, slab. Um, so, so this is your you're fixed it. You got fixed on 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 three sides and, and free on the other side. So that's that's it for um, cantilevered walls. So I'm, I'm going to go back just real quickly and review this part because it applies to all our um, uh, all our gravity wall systems. So all of our gravity wall systems, we're we're going to assume that we have these four failure modes plus. What's the fifth one that we don't talk about but we should if we would if we could? Global. Don't forget global. You don't want to be the engineer that spent all your time wor worrying about, um, you know, worrying about the bearing pressure down here and what was going on the toe there and you got the, the whole thing designed to find out that it fails like this. And it's happened. In fact, there have been cases where they intentionally did these stepped walls because it was really clear there was a global stability problem. They couldn't put one big wall up, so they just said, we'll put a lot of little walls because literally, you know, individually they're all stable. Well, that's fine, but it didn't eliminate the global problem. So don't, don't get caught with that one. Right, any questions about cantilevered walls? We'll take a break and we'll go on to gravity walls in five minutes. Okay.